This being the first Sunday of the month, I'm going to preach from the next psalm. And this morning it is Psalm 19. And I entitled this psalm, Three Incomprehensible Things. You might want to turn to Psalm 19. You'll be familiar with some of these words. It's one of the more, uh, more popular of the psalms. So three incomprehensible things. And look at the little symbol up there. We talk about that symbol. I may start using that symbol as I uh, preach from the psalm, at least in the introduction. The 19th Psalm has an inscription, as many of the psalms do. It's to the chief musician, a psalm of David. Well, that tells you one thing, that these psalms were intended to be sung. And that little symbol there is the Greek letter that is the, the name of that letter. I'll, I'll spell it for you and then I'll say it. It is P-S-I. And the P is silent. So that would be Psi, wouldn't it? it it's not the, the splasms. I've heard people try to pronounce the Psalms. Well, well, why do you say Psalm when it starts with a P? Well, it's that, that Greek letter is P S. And the P is silent. We have words like that, like a, well, well, like psychiatrist. You know, that starts with a P. But the P is silent. And in the Greek, they had a letter in the alphabet for that. The, the Psalms were written in Hebrew. And so when we're reading the Psalms, we're reading ancient Hebrew poetry. But they were intended to be sung. And, and the word that you would use for a poem that's intended to be sung when you're in the Greek would be it is a psalm. Now, now the word means, the verb of that is solo. And, and that word means to strike. And so you might see someone that, that would strike a guitar strings or banjo strings or, or probably in David's case a harp string to pluck the harp strings. And some have thought, well, if it's a psalm, then that means you have to use instruments to sing that psalm. But, but that's not so. Well, in the New Testament, this, the very idea of a song was a psalm. And, and a solo, a psalm, didn't mean to play the psalm. It meant to sing the psalm. And there's an interesting use of that word in the book of Ephesians where it says we're to speak to ourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in the heart. And that word making melody comes from that word solo. But it doesn't say making melody with a harp. It's making melody in the heart. These psalms are to resonate in our hearts. They're to strike our hearts. And the focus of the psalms is not on the musical element of it, but on what that psalm is teaching us. Well, that, the little Greek symbol, the, the, the first letter of the word psalmos, or of the word psalm, in the Greek, is that, that little symbol there, that Greek letter P-S-I. So I'll probably, it kind of looks like a little heart, doesn't it? And that's on purpose, because it's associated with that, uh, that thought and that word. And so I'll use that. The chief musician, Psalm of David. Here are the three incomprehensible things in that psalm. God's creation, God's word, and man's sin. Our minds really can't get the full grasp of those three things. Now the psalm ends in the last verse. It's a, it is a plea for acceptable worship. And we'll put that in the context of the psalm as we get there. So these 14 verses. Let's begin with that first one. God's creation. Psalm 19 verses 1 through 6. And I put it in a form so you can see the, 
the poetic structure of this as it was intended to appear when it's written out in the Hebrew. This is the King James Version, but I've just rearranged the, the form a little bit. All the words in the same order, but here's the form of them. And look for the parallelism of the ancient Hebrew poetry. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech. And night unto night showeth knowledge. There's no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth. And their words to the end of the world. You see the parallel, the heavens and the permanent, the glory of God and his handiwork day unto day, parallel with night unto night. You see how that structure's there in those Psalms? Look for that parallelism in the Psalms and, and really a lot in the prophets and the Hebrew poetry. And it helps us appreciate the beauty of it, but also it can help explain the Psalm as well. Why do we have the stars? Well, why'd God make stars and put them in the sky? Well, we've got two reasons found in the book of Genesis. When he made the stars, he tells us why they're there. God said, let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. Two reasons. Why is the sun and the moon and the stars and the sky? Well, one reason is to give light on the earth. There's another reason. It's for keeping time. For signs, for seasons, and for days, and for years. We know what a day is. It's a time that takes the earth to spin around one time, and we see that by the sun rising and setting and rising again. There's the day. Well, the, the sun's up there partly to mark what is a day. And then the seasons. We usually would associate that with the moon, the moon going through its phases of waxing and waning from the full moon to the new moon. And, and so we've got a month there. And, and then for years... The, the, the stars in the sky is the, is the earth ro uh, orbits around the sun. We see a different set of stars going through the, the night sky like that. You can tell what time of year it is. In fact, from the ancient times, they set out 12 divisions of stars. Called, they call it the zodiac. And, and these 12 constellations of stars, and, and they can tell by watching the, that, those 12 stars move across that night sky at a certain time to, to indicate what time of year it is. So there's a great calendar, it's like a great clock up in the sky with all these, uh, and the design of that is just amazing. And so that's why they're there. But this psalm tells us another reason. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth his handiwork. Yeah, the, the glory of God is seen in the heavens. And so there's a spiritual purpose that the stars and the sun and the moon are there as well. You, you take an atheist, look up in the night sky, and what does he see? Well, he sees lights in the sky. What about a believer? You look up in the night sky, what do you see? You see the glory of God. So that's the purpose. That's one of the reasons that the stars are in the sky. Psalm 8 and verse 1, okay? It says, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth who set thy glory above the heavens. You look at how glorious the heavens are. And realize God that made them is more glorious than that which he hath made. And so the glory of God is seen in the night sky. When I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers. Well, the, the, the firmament showeth his handiwork. Your fingers are on your hand. What you do with your fingers, you do with your hand. That's God's handiwork. Um... Do you have a craft that you like to do? 
Uh, I know somebody liked to quilt. You see someone's quilt that they piece together. That's their handiwork. And, and I've seen people roll out these old quilts and all the beautiful. People just, oh, how wonderful, how beautiful that quilt is. It's their handiwork. It's their artwork. Somebody says, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words. <laughs> And sometimes an artistic picture can mean more than even a real picture because you see from the mind of the artist displayed on that canvas. And that's what we have with the glory of God. You get out in the night sky and look up there and think about that and how God speaks to us through what he has made. Day into day uttereth speech. Night into night showeth knowledge. You know, the sky is beautiful all day and all night. Even an old cloudy, gray, overcast sky like this has its own wonder and mood about it. But sometimes you get out and you've seen those beautiful clouds rolling across that deep blue sky. It's just glorious, isn't it? And so day and night uttereth speech. Now, what I read was that that word uttereth and showeth has to do, it just welleth up, uttereth and breatheth out. And so you might say that the day uttereth speech and the night breatheth out knowledge from the things that we see in that sky. It says, there's no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Now look at the italics. I don't always put the italics in on when I do a PowerPoint here, but they're there, and it's in your King James Version. If you look, there is is in italics. And where is in italics? And the reason they put those words in italics, the translators thought that we need to complete this thought, and so they supplied words that really aren't in the text. And a lot of time that is so very helpful that they did that. But remember now, when you read the King James Version and you see the italics words, that's words that the translators put in there to help understand the sentence. And it's not words that are actually in the text. A lot of the newer versions, they do the same thing, but they don't put them in italics and you can't tell. So I really appreciate the fact that in the King James Version you can find those words because they're italicized. But if you leave out the italics, look what this says. No speech, nor language. Their voice is not heard. Now they declare the glory of God. But it's silent. You get out in that night sky and it's so quiet. You don't hear the stars. You can't hear what the sun says. But the message comes through loud and clear, doesn't it? And so without words and without language and without a voice, in their silence, they display to us the glory of God. It says their line has gone out into all the earth. What are we talking about? Well, now some of you will not remember this, but I remember there used to be a television show, a game show called What's My Line? You remember that? Some of you will remember that. And it was some story, some, and you had to try to guess and what their little story was. What's my line? Well, it's what they were going to say. We use that word line sometime in uh, talking about plays. So well, you need to go remember your lines, see? So it's talking about the words. Their line has gone out through all the earth is parallel to their words unto the end of the world. And the word word there, talking about the message that they send forth. What the stars in the heavens have to say is seen all over this world. Well, I've traveled, I've traveled down to the South Pacific and looked up at the night sky, same night sky that we have here. Isn't that beautiful? That was a little further south, so I saw a few southern stars maybe didn't see in the north. But all over this world, people get this picture. And so the, look at there, the world and the earth. See how they parallel at the end of that line? See the, the poetic thought structure that's in that psalm with the, the lines to the earth and the words to the world. And so everyone can see this. 
And Paul picks up on that in the book of Romans, in Romans 1, 18 through 20. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness because that which may be known of God is manifest in them for God has shown it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead so that they're without excuse. Someone says they don't believe in God, they have no excuse because he has clearly shown us by the things that are made Something about who he is and about his power and about his authority. And so there's no excuse. Their line has gone out into all the earth and their words into the end of the world. You better read them and believe. And then he talks about the sun. In them he shed a tabernacle for the sun. We talk about the beaming sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. Think about a wedding you've been to, and a lot of times, the way it was in our wedding, a lot of times weddings like this, you know, the, the bride comes down the aisle, but the bridegroom, sometimes he'll come out of a side door, doesn't he? Comes out, of, he's back here in his chamber. It's time for the wedding. So, so time for the for the groom to come forth. He comes forth and he walks up there. You ever seen a groom? He's just not beaming. Okay, they're just as his face is bright as the, and then that bride shows up and everybody turns around and looks at the bride coming down the aisle. See how beautiful and pretty she is. But next time you're at a wedding, when, when you're watching the bride and everybody's watching the bride, take just a minute looking around, look at the groom. He just beaming. That's why the sun comes forth, just in that manner. And then it says it rejoices as a strong man to run a race. I think of a, someone running that race, and he knows he's got this. He is ahead. He's rounding that corner, and he's the first one, and he just has to sprint to the finish. And look at that face. He is joyful. He knows, I've got this. The sun comes forth in the morning, bursting forth like that, just beaming like a bridegroom. I'm going to run that race from one end to the other. His going forth is from the end of the earth, his circuits into the ends of it, and there's nothing hid from the heat thereof. How's that happen? How'd that work out just like that? God made that. And we see his glory in that big, beautiful sun that rises up every morning. Those words are captured by Paul in Romans 10, 17 and 18. But he's not talking about the Son. He's talking about the gospel going into all the world. In Romans 10, 17 and 18, Paul writes this and uses words right out of this psalm. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yea, verily. And here it is. Their sound went into all the earth and their words unto the end of the world. That's not the light of the sun now. Paul's using this to talk about the light of the gospel. Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. And so the gospel goes forth into all the world, just like, like that sun shines all over the world, so also the gospel shines that way. That's what Paul is telling us in using those words. Now that brings us to the next one, and that is the Word of God. And again, I arrange this so you can see the, the poetic structure here. The Word of God is here, and look at the poet. It's seven lines, I think, one, two, three, four, five, six lines, six lines in parallel. It's the law, the testimonies, the statutes, the commandment, the fear, and the judgments. Now, a lot of those words are what someone might say, well, that sounds legalistic. Well, laws, it certainly does, doesn't it? See, there is a law of God that we're to comply to. There are commandments to obey. There are statutes that aren't going to be moved. And it talks about here the fear of the Lord. Well, that has to do with our attitude toward them. We are to respect and reverence. Isaiah talks about those who tremble at my word. 
And so all these are describing God's Word. And then look what it does in the parallel. It's of the Lord, 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 of the Lord. Six times tells us where this word comes from. These aren't just David's words. They're the words of God as they're spoken by the mouth of David. It's not just the law of Moses. It's the law of Moses as it was given to him by God. It's not just the gospel of Christ, what the apostles preached. Paul said, I preach what, what I received. And he received it of the Holy Spirit. So we've got God's word here when we're talking about the word affirmed over and over and over and over and over and over in the scriptures that this is God's word. And they're perfect. That they are exactly, God's word is exactly what God wants it to be. That's what it means when it says it's perfect. We use that word complete sometimes, but, but God's word came out and it's given to us. It's exactly the way God wants it given to us. And it is sure, you can count on it. It's right. It's pure and clean. And it's true and righteous all together. Look how he starts with perfect. And he ends with all together. See how that thought just flows? It's almost like it makes a circle here, doesn't it? And gets right back. We've got everything we need. And we've got it exactly the way God wants us to have it in his word. And look what it does. It'll convert the soul. I tell you, it's hard to turn a man around. You, you just try to, sometimes you can make somebody do what they ought to do. But the Bible does more than just make them do what they ought to do. The Bible gets in and changes the old man to a new man so that he says, you know, I want to do what I ought to do. That's the power of God's word. Converts the soul, makes wise the simple. Now the simple, that'd be the humble. That'd be the poor in spirit. And you don't have to be some kind of scholar to be wise. You have to have the humility to receive the things from the Word of God, and you will be wise. Rejoicing the heart. Well, I think it's in Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes where Solomon says, much, with much wisdom is much grief. Well, not when it's the wisdom of God's things. Not when it's the knowledge of God's Word. It will thrill your soul. Enlightening the eyes. Paul will use that expression in the New Testament. Writing to the book of Ephesians, telling why he's writing this epistle. And he is praying as he is writing this epistle that the eyes of your understanding will be enlightened when you read this epistle. And then enduring forever. I tell you, when God tells you something and it is true, it stays true. It's not subject to cultural whims or it doesn't evolve over time or it doesn't become your truth in this generation and that truth for this generation. No, it endures forever. And Peter picks up on that in 1 Peter 1, 22 through 25. Ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth. And the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is that word which by the gospel is preached unto you. That same gospel that was preached by the apostles and prophets in the New Testament that, that took a sinful man and put him in a saved relationship with God, that same word, it endures we can take that same word, it'll have the same effect on us. It endures forever. It's the seed principle. Plant the same seed, you get the same fruit. And the life stays with the seed. It endures forever. And it's wonderful. It's more to be desired than gold. Some remember talking in history about the 49ers and the 
Klondike Gold Rush and people have gold fever. Well, this is the more to be desired than gold. And we need to hunger and thirst after this, not after the, the, those passing, fleeting, material things of this world. What have you got? You'll have to leave it all behind someday. And you can take the truths and the blessings that this gives you to carry on forever. Yea, more than much fine gold. And I don't know if it was uh, David was thinking of this or just I think of this. But when I think of honey, I think of its gold color. And honey is sweet, sweeter than honey. And how do you get any sweeter honey than get it right out of the honeycomb? Well, that's about as pure and fresh a honey as you can get there, right out of the honeycomb. And so those are the words used to describe God's word. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Here you've got a warning, and you've got a reward. But you've got to keep them. See, there's laws. There's commandments. And so we keep them. But that word warned. Well, that brings us then to this last incomprehensible thing. And that is man's sin. You know, you, the scientists have yet to figure out all of the things God has made, this creation, and look into the sky. We, we think we have it figured out. Someone one time thought he could count the stars, and, and he counted, and, and they thought they pretty well, well, it had to be about this many, and then somebody came up with a telescope, and there's more and more and more stars. And then they found a, 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 beyond the stars are entire galaxies of other stars that we didn't even know were out there. And, and what lies beyond that? Well, it just, the mind can't get itself all the way around it. God's Word, you, you'll start off in a little Sunday school class and you might be a little infant. Pat, pat the Bible. You're learning right there. There's something precious about this. And you'll spend your life until you're like my father. I probably should have put that picture of him I got up here. Here he is, 88 years old. He's studying this. He's going through the, right now he's telling me he's going through Vine's Expository Dictionary with uh, Robert's Word Studies. And he's just digging in deeper and deeper into this word. Will he ever feel like he's completely grasped it all? No, no, he won't. The child can understand the basics and the old scholar will still be digging deeper and deeper for more truths. But what about our sin? You think you understand that? I've actually heard people say, I don't see how God should be so hard on us. Well, why would God send man, send him out of the garden just for eating a bite of fruit? Is that, is that, why was he so bad? How can God punish someone eternally for a temporary sin? And, and so they question God on that. But I tell you the problem, they don't understand sin. They don't grasp how bad sin is is. They try to make light of it. They don't understand. You want to understand? I'll show you how to understand. It'll help. You look at the sky and you know the glory of God is, is greater than the glory of the heavens. Now you'll understand something about sin but it's worse than this. But go stand before the cross and look at the innocent son of God suffering on that cross. And he did that because of sin. Don't make light of sin. Who can understand that? And he talked here about sin. Our secret faults and presumptuous sins. Well, that secret is that which is hidden. Well, we have some... We've had sins we hope nobody knows about, don't we? I mean... What we've sinned in our thoughts. We just want to keep that to ourselves. It, I, it worries me. It used to worry me more than it does now. But the judgment, you know, when, when every thought's revealed, oh, how embarrassing that's going to be. People will know I thought that about them. I tried to keep that to myself. You know, secret faults, hidden faults. And, and sometimes we can get pretty good maybe at hiding faults from others. Uh, sometimes our faults are hidden from ourselves. Uh, uh, so, sometimes we've done wrong 
we've sinned without really realizing that was sin because we didn't know what God said. It'd be harder than said we're not only responsible for what we know, we're responsible for what we should have known. And that's a wise saying. Secret faults. How do you understand that? But they're not all secret. Some of them are presumptuous. And you know what that means. You knew that was wrong when you did it. You knew that was the wrong thing to do, and you did it anyway. Secret thoughts and presumptuous sins. Keep back thy servant from presumptuous sin. Cleanse thou me from secret faults and keep me back from presumptuous sins. Then I shall be upright and I shall be innocent of the great transgression. That's a sin against God, the great transgression. And then here's how it ends. That the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. I've often heard that as a public prayer comes to a close. And it's a prayer that our worship will be acceptable to God. Now, if our worship will be acceptable to God, we read in the New Testament, it reminds me of this passage. True worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father seeketh such to worship Him. God's a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. You want your worship to be acceptable to God? Well, do the right thing for worship. And do it with the right attitude and the right heart. Do, do the right thing for the right reason. But there's something else. You can't go out and ignore God all week and think he's going to accept your worship when you gather together on Sunday. When Isaiah was preaching to those Jews, he talked about that sacrifice of offering you make is to come before God as a sweet-smelling savor. But to God, it stinks. Because you're not living right. Now, do you understand sin? Well, sin will block your worship. Who can understand that? Okay, so the world, the world God made and the Word God gave us and then our own sin. Three incomprehensible things. And let me then suggest a fourth by way of invitation and that is the grace of God. Who can understand that? Because He's made it possible through His Son to forgive that sin. And, and to count you as righteous before him. Can you grasp it? Well, we need to keep his commandments. Let's repent and be baptized and live in accordance with his teachings. And someday we'll be beyond the stars and with him in his glory. And so there's the invitation. You want to come forward as we stand and sing.